Thank you so much for inviting me. I am very honored to be among all of you. And we have talked about, like you said, belonging, and I believe it really comes from within. We talked about last time the power of your voice and, and the belief, because sometimes we, we believe in, in what other people say and all the critics, but the most important thing is the voice in our head. And how do you empower your voice so that you can make an impact? And today I'm gonna to share with you how to do that through storytelling. Uh, there are many reasons why we need to tell a story because stories always stories sell, but uh, the statistics don't or um, so today the purpose is the storytelling. So what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you the structure of how to have a good story. And then I will share with you a, a personal story, maybe a little silly. It's five minutes long. Uh, I used it for a Toastmaster competition and I won just to show you that it really doesn't have to be anything elaborate. And then I will share with you a, a, a professional storyteller who was on TED Talk is very powerful. And then I will share with you another story. My final story is a very serious story. And what I learned is how much um, they impact our health and building resilience. So you can take a, a, a bad experience and you can look at it from a different lens and tell a story. Now, when you're telling a story or you're writing a story, ideally is you write it as if you're going to tell it to someone else. You don't have to share it if you don't want to, but when you do, it gives you ability to really break away from a lot of limitation. For me, I had struggled with an incident for over 20 years. I have never talked about it to anyone at all, but I wanted I learned about the healing power of telling a story so I wrote it down and I will share that with you and I found that the source of me for a long time why I was apprehensive about flying why I was apprehensive about meeting new people why I was apprehensive about connecting or even taking kindness or taking compliment from people or even complimenting someone and once I had written the story and I shared it just with myself I said it out loud and I recorded myself and suddenly I felt that I was I was able to break away from a lot of, of the limits. So I'm going to share with you my screen and to, the purpose is to show you what is the structure of a story. So first of all um, what we will cover is why we need to tell our story. It gives us a voice, it empowers our us and then we're going to talk about how we tell the story. So how do we start? For me, it was always beginning. How do I even begin the story? When I was going to go to do a TED Talk, how do I start? It can be a quote. Uh, it could be a joke. For me, I found that my pattern is I just go straight to the story. Uh, some people like drama, so they would have something startling. It can be a startling uh, action, a recent incident. It can be a question, you know, like, have you ever had a bad day? It ended up great. So it can be anything. For me, if I started with a quote, I would say my favorite quote from Mother Teresa. She said, people come to us as a lesson or a blessing. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, this is very funny. Did she also struggle with uh, people, with someone in her life? And then I learned over time that people come to us, you know, when they say don't shoot the messenger, is that people come to us to give us a message. And the goal is for us to learn from that, to be able to move ahead and move forward and do greater things. But sometimes some people don't, they take it very personal and then it becomes stories that they tell themselves and it creates a lot of challenges for them. So those are some ways you can start. In your story, you wanna be able to build a rapport with people. So uh, how are we alike? When somebody listened to your story, how are we alike? If as your audience would think, you know, does a speaker understand me? Has a speaker been in my shoes? Does a speaker have any warts, your humanness? This actually, this last line is not mine. This is from Kay Fittis. She's a person who does high heeled success. And she's the one who says that, you know, she says, when I listen to a speaker, I want to know if he has any warts. Like, I want to know that they're not just perfect person out there with a great voice and very articulate and saying a great story. And then why do we want to listen to the speaker? Because, you, you know, we think about what is it, what's in it for me? Is there a problem? And then learn about solutions. So 
as humans, uh, we really want to learn about the challenges. It's not like we we like bad events. It's like we want to know how this person was able to merge. How can I learn from that? A few weeks ago, I had a guest speaker who traveled around the world. He's from Cincinnati, and he went around the world on his bicycle, and it took him four years. And as he was coming to do a cooking cooking class with my students, so he's going to make a, 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 a simple dish. And, my, and he brought the map of where he was around, all of these places he was. And one student goes, okay, you said you got attacked by an elephant. What happened? And then another student says, so you got in jail? You spent a night in jail? And I know that. And he was, he stopped and he scolded my students, obviously in front of the camera. And he says, why is it that everybody wants to know about the bad stuff? Well, for one, because he wrote that all these challenges on the map. So kids were curious. And he goes, okay, stop talking about problems and let's talk about the great things that happened to me. I met the love left of my, my you know, I met the person that I fell in love with. And it just killed that moment because children, adults, we are curious. It has nothing to do because we like, like I said, bad events. It's when we don't want to just have bad news. We want to know how that person got out of it. And that is one way to build rapport question and answer, or what is it I'm going to learn from this? What is my takeaway? And uh, so why we need it, like I said, statistics don't change anything, but stories do. They make an impact on ourselves. And we don't like to talk. We don't want to share our stories because we don't want to be vulnerable. Because we think about critic, it's that critic in us, we are worried about what will someone else say? We tend to be afraid of speaking. I have a teacher who taught, a colleague who taught for 20 years. And when we have parent event, she starts speaking very fast and sweating. I'm like, you know, they just, parents see the world through their children's eyes. Just imagine that they are kindergartners in your class. So they are the critics and they are the creators. And when we write the story, we become the creators and we move on to connect with people. And there was this quote that said, it is not the critic that counts, but the player in the arena does. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I'm gonna share with you a story. And I'll just go ahead and, and say to you exactly how I did when I was competing, okay? All right, so I'll go ahead and start. One late afternoon on my way home from work, I sat behind the wheel as traffic came to a standstill. I was already low on fuel, had left my wallet at home and my phone at work. My eyes fixated on the fuel gauge, noting the needle quickly plummeting to the E. Then the engine light turned yellow, indicating trouble. Traffic barely moved. I barely breathed. I turned off the music to save fuel. I wished my car could race like my heart. I was in full panic mode. Slowly, traffic began to pick up. At last, I pulled into the garage. At the dinner table, my husband announced that there would be a snowstorm. I felt beat. I dragged myself upstairs to the bedroom. And when I reached the window to lower the shade, to my horror, I saw that my car had been moved outside to the driveway. What? Why? My husband had taken it out of the garage and put his car inside instead. It meant that I had to wake up even earlier to scrape snow of my car. I did not say a word. In the morning, I realized that I had forgotten to wake up early. I jumped out of bed, dressed up in a hurry, rushed through the morning routine, and ran downstairs, skipping that hot, delicious, fresh coffee I smelled upstairs. And there was no time to pack my lunch. Oh, well. I opened the kitchen door leading to the garage. Shucks, no. I remember that my car was taken outside. But I went through that door anyway. What I saw was not what I had expected. Did I dream this up? My car was in the garage. I opened the back door, tossed my school stuff in the back seat, 
slammed it shut, plopped behind the wheel, and turned on the ignition. My eyes lit up and I jerked my head back as if I had been hit by the power of a good surprise. The engine light was gone. Then my heart fluttered with excitement when I saw the fuel gauge. The fuel fairy came. The kitchen door to the garage swung open and my husband came chasing me. Don't leave without a cup of Joe on the go. Funny, I said. Thank you, Joe. He handed me hot coffee in a mug and lunch to go in a bag. That was the best gift I have ever received from anyone in my entire life on any continent. My husband, what else? He showed me that the gift of one's time is the gift for happiness. How do I give happiness? For years, I listened, paid attention, and even took notes to make my gift joyful. Why gift give gift just on special occasions? Make each day a holiday, every meal a banquet, and every moment a gift. Kindness. Pass it on. No wrapping needed. So that was one story that I shared. It's actually four minutes and a half. And when I wrote it, I realized that my biggest issue was assuming. So I assumed the worst. Why would I do that? And I realized because I grew up in a single home, so I didn't see a, a connection. Uh, I have seen a lot of horror stories, you know, being a teacher for so many years and instances of abuse. So I was, I didn't grow up seeing kindness. And so when I saw it, like, wow, there's another way of doing things. So I'm going to share with you the next story is a TED, uh, from a TED talk. Uh, let me see. I'm going to share. This is going to be a video. And this is a little bit longer than my story. Can you hear it? Yes? Okay. Well, I'm Donald Davis, and I tell stories. If you come to see me at a festival, you will meet me uh, as a performer. But a great deal of the most important work I do is help other people find the stories from their lives that are most important to them. And because the theme today is reflection, it gave me an opportunity to think back about how I began to work with other people's stories and how I learned a few things about those stories. But to do that, I must tell you a story. I want to tell you a story that my father told me only once more than 50 years ago and then share his reflection on that story and then at the very end a tiny reflection of mine my father's name was joe a very common ordinary name our name is davis a even more common ordinary name and even in the town where i grew up waynesville north carolina there were three joe davises so they all had community nicknames so people could tell which one are we talking about this time there was Joe the photographer, not my dad. There was a farmer named Joe who always used his middle name, Joe Silas, so people could tell him apart. And there was my father who was the one man loan department in our little county seat, First National Bank. His community nickname was Banker Joe. Well, I was 13 years old when one day my mother was on her way to the Lady Fair beauty parlor. She didn't want me to go, so she dropped me off and left me at the bank with my dad. My dad would always have things for me to do at the bank. He'd give me an Addy machine and the phone book and tell me he needed all the phone numbers added up. And, and I'd spend all afternoon adding them up and then... But that day, it was his day to close up at the end of the day after the bank closed. We went out the door. He turned and he locked the door. And as he turned around, Mr. Pitt McCarroll across the street was just locking the front door of McCarroll's furniture company. 
they saw one another, and my daddy said, well, hello, Pip, have a good night. And Mr. McCarroll looked across at my dad and said, well, Cripple Joe, you have a good night too. And we went around and got in the car, and 13 years old, I turned to my dad and said, I didn't like that. He said, you didn't like what? I said, that man called you Cripple Joe. He's supposed to call you Banker Joe. My dad pulled the Plymouth back up into the parking space, turned off the key, and quietly said, let me tell you a little story. And I knew we were going to be there for a while. Well, the beginning of the story, I already knew about how my father, number eight of 13 children, was born in 1901 on a farm way in the North Mountains of Haywood County. In 1906, when he was five years old, he was out behind the barn watching his father and his older two brothers split cedar shingles to put a new roof on a little building. He was fascinated watching them, watching all the tools, the big fro and wedge and the draw knife, and especially a little short-handled axe that was very, very sharp so they could clean off the shingles with it. He wanted to help. He wanted to help. And they kept saying, you're only five years old. Get out of the way. You'll get hurt. Well, in a little while, my grandmother called them all to come to dinner, dinner on the farm in the middle of the day. And my granddaddy and the two older brothers headed inside to eat. And my dad thought, this is my chance. And he stayed behind so he could touch the tools he had been banned from messing with. He went over and pulled that little sharp axe right out of the end of a log where it had been left. And he told me he went around just chopping everything. And about that time, his mother called, come to dinner because little Joe hadn't come. And he realized, I better get in there, I'll get caught. And he went back over in a big hurry to chop the little axe back into the log. And he swung the axe, missed the log. It glanced off the edge and the blade buried itself deeply through his kneecap right into the center of his leg. And that's the way they found little Joe on the ground when they went to say why he hadn't come back. Well, my granddaddy called to my grandmother, bring a clean bed sheet while I saddle the horse. They got him up on the horse. My granddaddy got my daddy in his arms and rode to the nearest country doctor's house. The doctor looked at his leg and said, I've never seen anything like this. I don't know what to do. I guess I'll just have to take his leg off. My granddaddy got him back on the horse. They rode 16 miles on into Waynesville and went to the train station and asked the train agent, when's the next train coming and where does it go? The next train coming was not going to Asheville. It was going west toward the end of the Southern line in Murphy. But you could ride to Murphy, get a carriage around town, get on the L and N line and go to Atlanta. So my granddaddy bought two tickets, put my dad on a wooden bench, went out the door in about five minutes, he came back with a quart of homemade corn whiskey. And my dad said he began to give me medicine. And he gave him medicine and gave him medicine until finally my daddy said, I went to sleep or somewhere. And he remembered nothing about the 172-mile train ride. But once in Atlanta, somehow my grandfather found the brand-new 1906 Grady Hospital, and they saved my daddy's leg. They took off the kneecap. He left him, left him with a knee that would barely bend, and instead of a kneecap, a deep scar that a man's thumb could disappear into. 
Well, when they finally got back home, my daddy discovered he could not do work, especially farm work. And as he described it, he said, I became one of the girls. His mother, my grandmother, taught him to knit, and he became the family sock knitter. And later on, he learned to spin flax, and he could spin flax better than his four sisters. By high school, he began to realize he was going to have to find a way to make a living that didn't involve work. And in the papers the family got, he discovered that down in a place called Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a little school called King's Business College that would teach you how to make a living without working. So he sold socks and he spun flax and saved his money and saved his money. And when he was graduated from high school in 1918, he rode the train to Charlotte, found the little school and told them he wanted to enroll. They counted his money and told him he didn't have enough for one term. But he begged them to let him stay and learn as much as he could till the money ran out. And he began study and he began to school. And before that term was over, they came back and told him to go home and not waste the rest of his money. Because they explained to him that in less than one term, he had learned all of the business, bookkeeping, typing, and shorthand they normally taught in two years. He said, I had to learn. The money was running out. So he got back home without even a piece of paper to show that he had ever been to school, but with skills. And he was hired to be the first professional business manager ever hired by two old men to run a wholesale grocery company. The very next year, his father died leaving him five little brothers and sisters to finish raising and a widowed mother and an aunt who was a member of the household to care for. For the next 20 years, he raised the children, took care of his mother, took care of his aunt, raised the children, worked, saved his money, raised the children, worked, took care of his money, got to be 40 years old, and he told me he'd forgotten to do two things. He forgot to get married. I don't think he had time. And he forgot to spend money. And when he was 41 years old, the old man who had started that little bank in Waynesville decided to sell it. And my dad entered into the deal. And when he met my mother, when he was 44 and she was 25, he was Banker Joe. By now it was dark in the Plymouth. And my dad looked at me in the dark and he said, son, don't you get it? Don't you get it? If I hadn't gotten to be Cripple Joe, I would never have gotten to be Banker Joe. If I would never gotten to be Cripple Joe, I would be plowing with mules on iron duff, and you'd be in trouble with every teacher you've had who ever borrowed money from me. He said, you must learn that it is never, never tragic when something people think is bad happens to you. Because if you can learn to use it right, it can buy you a ticket to a place you would never have gone any other way. After that day, it was okay with me if people call my dad Banker Joe. But what I really liked was when people knew his whole story well enough to look at him and say, hello, Cripple Joe. Now, that's the story I heard once when I was 13. 
And years passed without my really thinking about it, but of course, never forgetting the story. About 30 years later, I was already doing storytelling and beginning to work with people on stories when I was visiting my father, now in the latter half of his 80s. And as we were visiting, all of a sudden, for some reason, that story came back. And I said to my dad, this is his reflection part now, how did you get to be able to tell the story the way you told it to me. Uh, had you told it before that? And he looked at me and he said, only about 200 times. And I got to hear a little story I almost missed. He said, when I came back from Atlanta, five years old, now with a crippled leg, mama, my grandmother who died before I was born, so I never met her. Mama sat me down at the kitchen table and she said, Joe, now it's time for you to tell the story. And he said, I said, I didn't want to tell the story because telling the story wouldn't change anything. I was crippled. And she looked at me and said, you're not telling the story to change what happened. You're telling the story to change you. And she made me tell it over and over again. And every time I told it, she gave me a different agenda. She said, now, Joe, this time tell the story and tell what you learned by living through that. And then another time, now tell the story and tell what you think your daddy and I learned from living through that. And eventually it was even tell the story and tell what you think the doctors in Atlanta learned from living through that. And we went on, we went on, and we went on. And one day she said, now, Joe, if you don't tell this story enough, when you're 50 years old, and you look at your leg, you'll be five again, and you'll be pitiful. Because when something happens to you, she said, it sits on top of you like a rock. And if you never tell the story, it sits on you forever. But as you begin to tell the story, you climb out from under that rock and eventually you sit up on top of it. He said, one day she said, now, Joe, today, tell the story and tell what you get to do now that your brothers don't get to do. And he said, I told the story and all of a sudden I was smiling because I realized I get to stay in the house and read while they work on the farm. And she had me tell that story and tell it and tell it until when I was about 15 years old, I decided that chopping my leg was the best thing I'd ever done in my life. And all of a sudden I realized she was right. The story doesn't change what happened, but the story has the remarkable power to completely change our whole relationship to happening. I almost didn't hear that part of the story. And I realized that I have two degrees from respectable educational institutions. I will not name them in this audience because they're in North Carolina. And yet I learned more about what I do, helping people discover the stories that are sitting on them and crawl out from under them from listening to my grandmother's story that I ever learned in school. The body you are randomly assigned at birth. Okay.
Did you like the story? Can you think of something in your life that you can change it? And um, if you can want to unmute yourself, a moment uh, could be in teaching, it can be in your personal life that you can write about it and share it the way he did. I wondered if anyone was going to say anything, and I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to just jump in here. Um, I received a letter, um, I would say, eight years ago, and my chapter, my chapter sisters, especially my friends on here will know this, but I received a letter, and um, it was from a girl asking, saying that her mother had told her that Harold Hardcastle was her father. Uh, she had known it for over 14 years but that she had never wanted to contact me because she knew how close I was to my mother. Well, my mother and father got separated and divorced when I was only three years old. So this girl was six years younger than I. And so she, you know, my father had moved on, but we knew nothing about any other children. There were five children in my family and I was the youngest. My mother has been gone now for probably six years. And it wasn't until a year after she died that this girl sent me this letter. She didn't want anything. She wanted to know her history because of my, not knowing my father. Well, lo and behold, this girl now is a part of our family. She had five siblings of her own and they had all died at fairly a young age. And um, so here's this girl, her mother had died and her siblings had were older and they had all passed. She is now a major part of our family and our family has embraced her and she brings us such joy. That is a story that I love to tell. I could have looked at it a different way. I could have had a completely different perspective. I could have thought, you know, I, I don't need any more sisters. I don't need any more brothers. But I welcomed her into our home, shared after meeting her, shared her story and her with the rest of my siblings. And we have embraced her who had no family left with the family that she has now. She attends all of our family get togethers and it is a blessing for all. How would you tell that story? So what are the things this guy did? Did you notice how when he spoke about his dad, some of the things he did? And he, what made his story interesting? Can you think about some of the strategies? He you did. unmute yourself. There you are. What did he do to make his story, you know, like very interesting. We were glued like for me when I listened to him for the first time, like I wanted to know the rest. I wouldn't leave for anything, you know, phone rings like I'm not listening. I'm not gonna, what did he do? Do you know any of the, can did anything uh, come to mind? Did anything really, uh, capture your attention that some of the techniques that he used to tell the story? I think the sequence of events, the sequence of his events yes. were amazing. The sequence, uh, also when he uh, said when his dad did the, the it turned on the ignition for the car, he used the hand gesture when he said raising the kids. Mm. So using your body language to help and also notice he didn't speak very fast. He spoke very slowly. He turned around whenever it's another person speaking. So for example, I'd say, well, I, I spoke to my mom. I spoke to my dad. So using your body to emphasize and also uh, says, you know, one way you know you, your story healed you is you're able to tell the story but not to experience the story where you can able to say it and either laugh at the things that, you know, could have been hurtful or you could have cried at the time. 
and that's how you know you heal, then you want to be able to retell the story in so many different ways until that stops. And then you feel, okay, now I can breathe. So I'm going to share with you a story. And I would like when you record the session today to share it with only you, but not to put it online, just because it's a very, um, it's a, it's a, part where I struggled with this for 20 years and then I will show you how I was able to hear a heal from the story and how I was able once I wrote the story down I've never shared this I don't share this uh, but it helped me I said it many times I re I recited so that I actually memorized a, a little bit the beginning and the end and that's one technique I learned that you want to do when you're telling your story that way you start strong and you end strong so I'm actually going to stand up because I'm not able to, you know, like feel like when you're a teacher, like you're not able to I actually cannot sit down. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, share this story. Uh, okay. okay. So the title of this story is called There's a Reason for Everything. So growing up as in, uh, in North Africa was very challenging to me. Um, being a young, um, growing up, the, there was a lot of challenges because I was very inquisitive and I was intelligent and that is a bad combination for any young African girl. There was a lot of injustice in my culture, but I could not articulate that because we don't have the wor words for unjust and unfair in our language. And one day, I said, Mimi, and my grandmother looked up at me like, what now? And I said, Mimi, many young girls have to quit school to marry ugly, old men, why? And she sighed, there's a reason for everything. I wanted to know right then and there, what were these reasons? Mimi, and what were these reasons? That's it, there's a reason for everything. Yes, grandma. When I grew up, I went on to become a teacher. When I came to the US, I learned English. And I wanted my classroom to be marked by two things. I wanted my classroom to be marked by logic, to make sense to all of us, me and my students. I also wanted my students to have inquisitive minds like mine. By the second year of my teaching, my students had traveled to East Africa as the youngest to ever go on an expedition. And I, they, I have received inquiries from all around the country, including one teacher from Pennsylvania. She wanted to know how I traveled with children so young and so far and so well. I had taken my eighth graders to Tanzania because that year there were the Ku Klux Klan coming in in Lafayette, Indiana, and my students wanted to do something about it. In the end, that project ended taking them to Earth Watch, it's a, and they ended up getting a full scholarship. So this teacher, she wanted to know how I traveled so well because she was taking 16 students on a 10-day trip to Paris. And as I was giving her my insight to help her have a positive experience and successful trip, she told me something that no one ever told me in my life. She told me, you are a good teacher. And I, I froze to the ground. First of all, no one ever told me I was good at anything. And then to be called a teacher that suddenly I felt I have an identity. I was so moved and touched by that comment. I wanted to do something back. I told her that I will travel with her, that I will go with her. I can go with her to France. And from there, I can take the train and visit my aunt who is in Geneva, Switzerland. She gave me her phone number and I took up uh, when the time came, it was July. I flew from Indianapolis and went to JFK and it was a strange summer day. The plane lingered on the runway for no reason. 
When I got into the airport, people surrounded me as if I worked there. People asking me strange questions. All I wanted to do was to run to my connection. I ran, I had my purse, my carry-on, another, another suitcase back when we could. I ran to the gate and the ticket agent frowned. The gates are closing, she said. Yes, but I know you can let me in. I begged, I pleaded, please let me go. I need to connect with my group. If I don't go on this plane, I might as well not go at all. I'd have to, might as well go to Geneva. And she booked me on the flight that left an hour later from another terminal. At first, it was like the story of the hat and the cat. I sat, 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 and I felt very distraught. I don't remember much about the next flight to Switzerland, but then it dawned on me, I'm gonna arrive 10 days too early to my aunt. What am I gonna do? Like, hey, long story, wrong neighborhood. A long story, a wrong place, but I'm in the neighborhood. To my surprise, my aunt came very quickly. And I noticed her eyes were very red. My family is known for boku boos. I thought maybe she was partying all night. She hugged me very, very tight, like she always does. And then she stared at me. So I wiped my face. She didn't cut it out. She kept staring at me. So I wiped my face again. Then I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I looked in the mirror. I saw nothing, no smudge, no food I didn't eat. But I noticed this look of disappointment, dismay, and exhaustion. So I go back to the airport where my aunt was at the lobby. Est-ce que tu veux un petit café? She asked me if I wanted to have coffee. I, despite the jet lag, I was not interested in, in taking a nap. Oui, bien sûr, yes, of course. She drove me in her tiny car. And I, I was remembering how she perfectly parked parallel. And I felt like I couldn't even make a connection to help another fellow teacher. And nothing that morning could take my mind from feeling the sense of having failed. And I don't remember the flight numbers of planes that I take, much less the ones that I miss, but I remember that flight very well because I worked so hard to make my connection. I wanted to, I had a purpose, I had a mission to help a group. And as we were walking on the, after she stopped, we were walking on the sidewalk. We stopped by a kiosk, it's this long thing where they sell newspaper magazines and cigarettes and candy. And on the stand, there was this newspaper wide open with a picture, it was in full color, with a plane in midair, in full color, but in full flame. And at the bottom, TWA 800, the flight that I had missed by two minutes. I didn't know what to say. And in my head, I got on my knees and I remember saying, no, 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 as if I wanted to, to change the events. And I looked up and I saw my aunt. She was still staring at me. And then I realized she knew she knew about the plane. Her eyes were red from crying, thinking that I was on the plane. And her stares are from disbelief that I was right there in front of her. And suddenly I had mind movies playing in my head of all the people that day that came to ask me dumb questions to make me miss my flight by only two minutes. I never talked about that story, but ever since, when a flight, when, when the alarm clock malfunctions and that wake me up, 
when there's a delay that holds me back and there was an unforeseen challenge that I can't explain, I know there's a reason for everything. And that's how I learned to become patient. And that is the end of my story. Thank you. And so for me, for a long time, I had this guilt for having lived. And when a teacher and 16 students didn't, I wondered if I didn't go, would she have gone? And I know she wanted, she was going anyway. And so we have this guilt and I had this fear of connecting with people. I didn't want compliments because I didn't want like that teacher complimented me. I was afraid of planes, but all of these things, I had no idea where they were coming from. But once I wrote the story and was able to make sense of it, and it was the, the quote from Mother Teresa that said, people come to us as a, bless, as a lesson or a blessing. And like, you know, she was a blessing, that teacher and her students. And also she was a lesson to say, you know, that sometimes, things happen to us in a way to what is the big picture. And every day I think about her. And when I teach, I teach for her. And that was where the connection of helping fellow teachers and being very devout to helping and making a difference. So what I would like you to do in your chat, or if you would like to un unmute yourself, what are some, um, takeaways from today, and then we can go and, and go over the stories. Hopefully you can unmute yourself or that our struggles, our darkness is a light for someone else. Yes. yes. What are some questions you have you would uh, like to um, so you don't feel you don't have to when you write your story you don't have to write it for a person but when you write it for it to be a healing you want to write it as if you are going to and if you can find the courage to share it with each other it would bring so much healing in the east and many asian cultures they believe that all the diseases come to us from our emotions negative emotions. So for example, they believe the cancer is from holding on to bad things, to the same thing and replaying it. And every time we play a bad event or a story, we are getting re-traumatized in our mind as if it's happening all over again. And by writing it down and having all the details, you take it out of your mind and you're able to release whatever challenges. So ideally is if you can write it down and go over it. And then if you would, um, you know, if it, if it works to share it with someone or to record it and keep improving it. And like this person said, you know, try to say it for what is the takeaway? So for me, instead of having shame and guilt and, and, and say all oh, these people, you know, wasted my time, you know, I, I should have been on that plane and I shouldn't, um, you know, instead of doing that, like, you know, no, the time for them has ended, but for me is to go back in the classroom and make a difference and teach compassion and to, but for that time, I have created so many blocks. I had, I created doors that didn't even exist. I closed windows that were not there. I closed all the lights because I became so private. I built so many walls around me. I didn't want to talk about, even my family, I never shared the story shared it with anyone like this is my issue I don't need to talk about it and I just became a very silent and I was happy in my own classroom and my own world and and I used to remember saying to myself I teach my lesson but once I was able to understand I stopped saying I don't teach my lesson I teach the children and sometimes I have this great lesson I don't teach it at all if there's an issue if there's a meltdown like it doesn't matter I'm going to work with these issues and I found when I did that, my teaching went to a whole different 
uh, path and kids were very successful, suddenly things are happening in my life and my students. And I do the same thing, take whatever bad thing happened and we don't need to say it happened because of me. For me, that's for a long time. It happened. It was, I know, like I know it happened that I'm probably the one who caused this issue, you know? And then once you let go and I says, no, I think the universe and God, whatever religion is to us and say, it came for me to learn to become patient. I became very patient with everyone, with all the kids, anyone I can just, and, and it's interesting because that day when the plane, uh, when I was stopped was one elderly lady she came to me and asked me a question, but she reminded me of my grandmother and I couldn't say no. So I had to give her the direction. And then in the end, she gave me an orange and I had all these carry on and I looked around. I didn't want to hurt her feeling, but I was going to throw it in the trash can. Like, I don't have time for this. She's exactly like my grandmother. Give me all these useless things I don't need. But in the end, it was the only thing that I had to eat was the orange. And so like the universe has, we have our back covered to know that we are in a safe place. We just need to make sense of it. Um, so if you have questions, I'm here to answer anything, uh, whether how you write the story to yourself or ways to help you heal. Notice the whole pattern, the whole theme is about healing. We can't talk, we can't connect with others if we don't connect with ourselves. We cannot share our stories if we not able to let go and look at things from different perspective and looking at what is the good in the story? What is my takeaway or what is my learning? So please unmute yourself, ask away. We have about six minutes and I'm happy to come back and anytime you would like, you can, I can also put my email, feel free to, here is my personal email. Um, if you want to help with your own story, can help you with that it's lckubash at Yahoo. I'll give you my cell phone number. And that's what it is. So you can contact, you can ask questions. Uh, and I can help you with your story if you would like. We can do one night of story sharing, storytelling. Layla, something I noticed, you're not just telling the story. It's full of details and it's the presentation. Has this been something, is this a talent that just comes naturally for you or is this something that you have developed? I have developed where they say uh, show and not tell. So for example, instead of saying I was frustrated, I needed to show you that I was frustrated. So I did like this when it came to my grandmother. So I was taking back to this, the event and going through the emotion, it's in one way to not only release the issue, the emotions, but also to bring it to life. And I could have said, well, my mother was frustrated with me instead of, I used her tone of voice when she said, there's a reason for everything. So how she spoke fast as if she was upset with me. And uh, when I ran and I said, I begged, I implored, and I pleaded because that's what I did. I kept repeating myself, please let me go on the plane. And at first I was like having this thing. So I know you can, you know, and the reason I said that because I used to work for the airlines. I know she could open the door, let me in. I know you can, you know, you close. So it was um, try to go back in anything, look at your story and see how you can, you know, the, in Missouri, the license place is a show me state. It doesn't say the tell me state. <laughs> So you want to think of that if you can look at every after you write it, you think about how can I take this particular sentence and make it into the present tense or and, and be in it. And so notice for the voice when I did for my grandmother, I you can move yourself so I can say I'm from here and from here. Or also when I bent down when I looked at the newspaper, I got on my knees and then I looked up at my aunt. I did the same thing in the story. So I got down and I just go back and look down. And I, that's when that moment I realized that she was not looking at the newspaper. She was still staring at me. And that's when I realized her eyes were red because she had been crying when I thought she was, been, she was drinking and partying all the time. And so I realized, look how much I wanted to convey in my story, how much when we don't know the facts, we don't ask questions, how much we tell stories to ourselves that are wrong, how much we assume, 
And then actually I was afraid of her driving me because I thought she's probably drunk. And then I watched her like, wow, how can a drunk person really parallel park so well? And I can't even make a plane. I can't even make a flight. So that's what I was having all this story and making things even harder, weighing on my heart so much, not realizing the whole thing. And that's because, you know, we whenever we get into a conflict with people, nobody ever says we communicated too much. It's always for not talking things over and not communicating too much. And that's what I tell the students. Uh, I don't tell them the story because I don't share it, but I, I give them different examples. So kids remember, kids, adults, everybody remembers the stories, but nobody remembers the facts. So if I had the story and I said, I'm gonna give you this bullet point why really sometimes we cannot use logic. Sometimes there is a reason for everything. You, you would have, felt like you're ready to tune out from, nobody cares about bullet points. I take all questions while they're free. Would you be interested in telling your own story? Anyone? After what we've heard from you, <laughs> it would take weeks to prepare something. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. If we need to start from somewhere to lighten the load from our hearts. Uh, can writing fiction be healing? Um, no, if it's, uh, if, it, if it's really bad, sometimes we can traumatize ourselves because we are imagining all the bad things. Um, so uh, ideally is where you write something happened to you, but you can change some of the things. You can add fiction elements, act like if you're writing a book and you can actually take a bad stories and you can change your it to make it have a better ending. And actually that can be a healing too. That's, that has a scientific name for it in psychology, but you can take any, but different, at the end of the day, I've known some people who do this for themselves, self-healing. You can go through the events of the day and anything that you didn't like about your day, you can just imagine a whiteboard, you erase it and create a different story. You can, and something positive, um, you can, uh, so that, that would definitely have a lot of healing. You'll sleep better if you're having grinding your teeth, that would help with that. You would feel much more at ease You can breathe better. So some people do this as a journaling way every day. Uh, another way you can do it is if you, you can tell the story and record yourself and listen to yourself and you hear it from a different, it, it will feel like you're hearing it from someone else. It's another way. Layla, this has just been so powerful, and uh, we we really do appreciate you and the time you've spent and the honesty that you've shared and your story. Um, we we just we are just so blessed to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. I hope you got something out of any of the three uh, series. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, for anything, if you want to be helped one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to help uh, listen to your story, give you feedback. Toastmasters is a great place to do it. Uh, they do have it online. They have online clubs and they are exceptionally compassionate and kind and they give feedback in a way that's empowering. And for me, what I did is I would listen to other people and I wanted to learn how to give feedback. And by listening and giving feedback, I was able to give the feedback to my own story. So you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's probably the most empowering thing I have done to help me become uh, a better speaker, have some confidence. You do it well. Ooh, Thank you. Cindy, is there anything you would like to say? No, I would just really like to end it with, you know, again, thanking you 
uh, Layla, for sharing your time with us tonight. Uh, I truly believe, and I think many of our sisters will agree, that people do come to us as a lesson or a blessing. And, you know, your, your messages that you sent to us today are a blessing. And we greatly appreciate the time that you spent with us. I want to thank you. I want to thank, you know, our Delta Kappa Gamma sisters for joining us for this biennial seminar. And um, Layla, we can't thank you enough. And we greatly appreciate the time and effort you have, you have put into um, these three sessions. Thank you so much. I wish you an amazing evening, a very happy summer. And again, you have my contact. Feel free to ask. Um, happy to volunteer doing anything for you, always. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And Layla did put her email address and her phone number in chat. Great. Again, if you want PDUs, make sure you send me an email letting me know what you need, and we'll make sure you get the certificate that you need. Thanks so much, girls, and have a wonderful rest of your summer. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Linda from Alpha Chi. Could I talk to you just a second? Absolutely. Linda from Alpha Chi. Oh, oh not, not me. <laughs> Other Linda. Sorry. Other Jane. Linda. <laughs> She's muted. Yeah, there are. Yes. Hey, Linda. Quick question. I, I received an email. Well, actually, a, a survey filled out from one of your members, Rush Rogers. Is she no. in your chapter? I don't know that name, no. Okay, she's got her chapter as Alpha Chi. And what was the name again? Rush, R-U-S-H, and the last name is Rogers. She's got Rush Cohen Rogers. I've called her, she says she lives in Columbus. Um, I've called her, I've emailed her for two weeks. And I can't get her to return anything. So she's not one of yours. No. Well, the mystery continues. <laughs> it was, she, it's Lambda something, something Lambda. Oh. I can, I'll see if I can find it. Well, you know what? Let me look. Sometimes the directory on DKG works and other times you put people's names in and it says, I mean, I put my own name in and it says there's no records to match me. Oh. So, you know, it's crazy. Oh. And I, somebody sent me an email the other day. They were trying to find a chapter for their mother and the chapters dissolved. She was a former oh. member and we're trying to find her someplace else. So I go to the DKG website and I thought, oh, this is great. The whole map's there. You just click on the state and you, you put in the person's address and it populates the chapters surrounding them except for about eight states. And guess who state was one of the eight that hasn't been finished? Uh, it's ours. Well, so you, you think she's Lambda? Well, it's something Lambda. Okay, something Lambda. Okay, um, all right. Diane, I bet Diana has it. Oh, there's Actually, no doubt. She could just like right now. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. but Rush had worked with Joanne Bent, Bentler or Bensler or, to do that camp for girls okay was it the owl camp or something that one over oh geez i don't i can't that pat but that pat cermak had the one that pat was um promoting yes yes, no, yes. okay okay all right well both lindas thank you very much i appreciate your help <laughs> good you're night. welcome you're welcome <laughs> good night good night